have a very good story to tell you. It is a story full of potential and promise. Uh, it is a story from the field of synthetic biology. And best of all, this story is true. And I know it's true because I have seen it with my own eyes. But before I can tell you this story, what I need to do is tell you a little bit about this field of synthetic biology. And to do that, I'm going to start in what might seem like a strange place, and that is with a poem. It's a poem that you may know. It's a poem by Joyce Kilmer. And we're going to look at just the last two lines of the poem, which say, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And honest to goodness, I think he was talking about me when he wrote those lines, because for the life of me, I cannot grow a plant in my house. I have tried. My best example is this one. It's an avocado that I grew from a pit. But most of my plants look more like this, where they will grow for a while, and then they will brown and shrivel and die. And having done this experiment a couple of times, I have a really good hypothesis. I think that the plants need not only sunlight, but also water. <laughs> and I'm going to use this watering challenge, my watering challenge, to introduce the field of synthetic biology and to show you how it might differ from other fields of engineering. So uh, I work at a really darn good engineering school, and if I walked my watering challenge over to my friends in mechanical engineering, this is a solution that they might come up with. This is a pot where the weight of the water sits at the base of the pot, and as the water evaporates, the pot tips over. And I would probably notice that and remember to water my plants. <laughs> So that's a really nice solution from my friends in mechanical engineering. Now, if I walk this watering challenge over to my friends in electrical engineering, this is a solution they might come up with. It has wires and resistors and sensors all connected to a breadboard. And when these plants get thirsty, the water is automatically dispensed, and so I don't even have to remember to water my plants. And that is a very nice solution from my friends in electrical engineering. But I am not a mechanical engineer, and I am not an electrical engineer. I am a biological engineer. And so my solution might look a little more like this. I might look around the natural world to find an organism that doesn't need much water. And I would say, aha, a camel doesn't need much water. So I'll take those special genes out of the camel, and I'll put them into my plant. And while I'm at it and maybe get fancy, I'll take the special genes from a firefly that make it glow, and I can put that into my plant too, and I'll have a glowing, never thirsty plant. <laughs> it's a million dollar idea, you know? And um, it's not easy to do, you know, not, not at all, but I could try it. I could try it with the tools of genetic engineering and molecular biology. I could use sequence data to identify the genes from the camel and the firefly that I need. I could use polymerase chain reaction, PCR, to amplify those genes. And I could use recombinant DNA tools to piece those genes together and to put them into my plant. So that's how I might make a glowing plant. But now, I promised I would use this example to illustrate the field of synthetic biology. So let me ask, what if what I really wanted to make was not a glowing plant? But what if what I wanted to make was this? A tree house that I could grow from an acorn that would grow into a two-bedroom, two-bathroom tree house. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I don't think anybody really knows how to do that. But here's one thing I do know. I'm going to need more than those three tools. Um, and that is where the field of synthetic biology is really stepping in. Synthetic biology is drawing lessons from more mature, more robust engineering disciplines and applying those lessons to biology. Lessons like standardization of parts and abstraction for design or fabrication tools. 
The folks who are working in synthetic biology, many of them are inspired by the awesome development that we have seen in personal computing. And synthetic biologists remember that the leaders in computing were working in really humble spaces like these to develop standard parts that they could use to build uh, computer instruments, and they were coming up with simple design rules that could be reliably followed. And uh, with standardization of parts and some simple design rules, computers like these were available in the 1980s, and we all know how far and how fast the computer uh, industry has come since then. So synthetic biologists are trying to take a page from the same book, and working in laboratories all around the world, there are engineers and scientists trying to standardize biological parts so that they can reliably program living cells. They are trying to describe simple design rules that they could follow so that they could program cells reliably. And with these tools of synthetic biology, those are being applied to some of the most persistent and challenging problems and human needs that we face. So synthetic biology is being used in agriculture. It's being used to produce medicines. It is being used to make microbes that can make biofuels. And microbes are being designed for environmental remediation. So all over the world, scientists, engineers are using synthetic biology, and companies are cropping up to try to reliably program cells uh, to face some of these challenges. But now you may be thinking, uh, does that really work? Like, can you really program a cell the way you would program a computer? And maybe you're also wondering, should we even really be doing that? Um, these are questions that synthetic biology is facing, uh, and I want to say that they're not really new questions to life science. So what I'll mention now is a historical example. This example comes from the 1970s, when recombinant DNA technology was first being introduced. This is um, a short clip I'll show you from Cambridge, Massachusetts, with Mayor Vellucci, the mayor of Cambridge, when he is being presented with guidelines from the National Institutes of Health that were intended to keep the uh, scientists working with recombinant DNA safe and intended to keep the communities around the labs the, uh, uh, safe from recombinant DNA. And Mayor Vellucci asks a series of questions to this panel of scientists. And these are interesting questions, um, relevant now, perhaps. And so um, what I'll do is show you now a, a short couple minutes of this Cambridge City Council hearing where Mayor Vellucci is posing questions about this emerging biological technology. Of all the members of the City Council, I would like to in, uh, inject this statement of questions not to be answered at this time, but for the for the benefit of members of this city council who may want to ask these questions. One, did anyone in this group bother at any time to write to the mayor and the city council to inform us that you intended to carry out these experiments in the city of Cambridge, and you just said that you had public hearings? You plan to use E. coli in your experiments. Do I have E. coli inside my body right now? That's a question. Don't answer, but you may as you go along. Does everyone in this room have E. coli inside their bodies right now? Can you make an absolute 100% certain guarantee that there is no possible risk which might arise from this experimentation? Is there zero risk of danger? Answer that question later too, please. Would recombinant DNA experiments be safer if they were done in a maximum security lab a P4 lab in an isolated, non-populated area of the country question. Will this be safer than, safer than using a P3 lab in one of the most densely populated cities in the nation? Question. Is it true that in the history of science, mistakes have been made to, known to happen? Question. Do scientists ever exercise poor judgment? Question. Do they ever have accidents? Question. Do you possess enough foresight and wisdom to decide which direction the future of mankind should take? Question. The great war poet Joyce Kilmer once wrote, Forms are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. 
<laughs> so uh, those are questions that I won't be answering, but I will say recombinant DNA technology was enabled in Cambridge uh, in the 1970s. Um, I did, at the start of my talk, promise you a story, and you've been very patient. Um, so here is my story. Once upon a time, there was an emerging field of engineering called synthetic biology. And synthetic biology promised to make the living world better. But early on, the greatest success in synthetic biology came in an unexpected place. It came in the classroom. I have been teaching with synthetic biology at MIT for about 10 years now. And I have seen the power that this approach has for exciting students about learning. Do you remember how we learned when we were really young, where we would explore the world the way scientists do by trying things and grabbing things and maybe breaking them and trying to fix them? Uh, somehow, though, the formal education system can really dampen that eagerness that we have to explore. And for a lot of students, it can be a difficult transition, a disappointment. I think we turn away a lot of students early from these very exciting fields because we convince them that it is more important that they have the right answer than that they ask the right questions. But I have seen that with synthetic biology, there is a, a re-excitement about exploration in my students. Synthetic biology really connects the content that they are learning to a context. And I've seen them stick with really hard problems for a very long time. And so having seen the, the power of teaching with synthetic biology, I was eager to expand the reach of this approach. And so I collected all of my MIT teaching materials and have housed them at a site called BioBuilder. And working with award-winning teachers uh, throughout the country, we have created teachable modules in synthetic biology that everyone can try. Middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, enthusiasts who are working in community laboratories. These are folks who are building biosensors, putting Boolean logic gates into cells. And what I'd like to do is show you some slides from a student and teacher workshop uh, to give you an idea of BioBuilder in action. Uh, at a student workshop or in the classroom, uh, students begin with comic strips that set up the authentic questions that, are, uh, that exist in synthetic biology. And they come up with answers. They think about these, they come up with ideas, and then they share their ideas with one another and with the class as a whole. And when they feel ready, they go with their teacher into the laboratory, and they carry out authentic investigations where they try to build things made from biology. And this is a really exciting time for them. Students have ownership of the data they care about it a great deal. They look at it carefully, they talk about it with other students, and they talk about it with their teachers. And then they do what scientists do, and they share it with the broadest community. BioBuilder provides an online data sharing portal so that they can share what they've discovered. They can come up with new experiments and propose those and try them out. And what it does is it builds a really collegial community, not only of students, but also of teachers. So we run teacher training workshops to enable teachers to teach synthetic biology. They start with classroom and small group activities, and then we bring the teachers into the laboratory to try their hands at these experiments. And together we have found there is an empowered group of teachers, teachers ready to work with their students at the very edge of what is known. And we find that it reconnects the teachers to their own love of learning, and to their love of teaching. And so what I'd like to do is end by just mentioning that I am a, not only a scientist and an educator, but I am also a mom. And so I know firsthand how tough school can be sometimes, how uh, students can sometimes feel very powerless and small, and how the content that students are learning can feel very disconnected from their real world and their real life. But because synthetic biology is a new field where we don't have all the answers, and because building things made from biology is a great way to learn science, 
I think BioBuilder has great potential and promise, not only to advance the field of synthetic biology, but maybe even more importantly, to really envision the kind of education that we would all like to see. Thank you. Thank you.